know, do you think entrepreneurs are born or made? So can somebody become an entrepreneur or is it something that is innate or is it something that's learned? Like what, what do you, how do you view it? Okay, so I, I've given a lot of thought to this and I've come up with two schools, right? There are choice entrepreneurs, people who end up in entrepreneurship by choice. I had classmates like that. While we were all dreaming about all the firms we work for, these guys already knew they were going back to the city to work with their uncle or in their parents' business. They never, ever thought of working under anybody, mm -hmm. right? Those were the choice entrepreneurs. And then there are the chance entrepreneurs, those people who, you know, you, you are on the um, employment track and then you find out, I can do more, I can be more, I want more. And then you start to think, oh, and then there are other people who, maybe for them, the light bulb came up when they got fired from their job. And then the betrayal, the feeling of betrayal was so intense that he said, I'll never let anybody do this to me again, right? Mm -hmm. So for the choice entrepreneurs, I think it's very clear cut. And when people say entrepreneurs are born, I think human beings are shaped by their environment. It's very, it's very uh, possible that you are born into a family of business people. You grew up seeing your dad, your mom, your grandmom, your granddad being in business. You were always at the shop, at the office. You always seen money. You saw the... So, those people grew up, those people turned out to be your idols. You never for one day thought about working for somebody else because you could see the independence, the fulfillment in these people firsthand. For mm -hmm. many of us, we didn't get that benefit. We grew up seeing our parents going to work either in a bank or in school or something. So we just thought that that is how uh, life is supposed to be. And this goes to how our environment shapes us as human beings. So for those people who say they are, they are born as entrepreneurs, when you, when you look deeply, it's very likely you will see major influences from their immediate family. Mm. They grew up close to somebody who was in business and, and, and stuff like that. But for those of us who have to talk ourselves into it or rediscover ourselves in the process, it's a much more difficult um, conversation because it's like you are changing the game midway. You had an identity for yourself in the beginning and now you're going to change course. It's much more difficult. So... For most people, they just don't make the, the leap. Yeah. They never jump. Yeah. It, just, it just stays there and then I'll do it next year. I'll do it 10 years later. And then before you know what's happening, the game is over. Yeah. yeah. I like that. So choice or chance and even, I guess, crisis in the middle, entrepreneurs. Exactly. <laughs> I think I'm a bit of a, I think I'm more of a chance entrepreneur. I don't think it was necessarily something I chose, but it's fascinating to kind of hear how you've described it. So obviously at the beginning, one of the things I said is when I grew up, I want to be just like you. So in 2018, <laughs> I know you were, um, you received this huge accolade from LinkedIn, um, named as a top voice on, you know, as part of um, entrepreneurship for Africa. Um, and you have a million followers. You know, I'm struggling to get, I won't even tell you how many followers I've got, but it's not even, <laughs> nothing close to that. So I need to borrow some of yours. But, you know, I mean, as part of this theme of, you know, fans and followers into customers, tell us about that specifically. How did that come about? You know, what does that mean for you and your business right now in terms of the, the LinkedIn accolade? Okay, so um, I, I like to always start from a very simple premise so that, Anybody who's listening to this, no matter, what their no matter what their background is, they can relate to this and they can see it as something that they can also do. So I remember joining LinkedIn when I think it was pre-2010, right? And I got this sense when I got on the internet community that Africans fit the stereotype of consumers. Even when it comes to information, Africans are typically consumers. We consume what other people create and then to the outside world, it looks like there's no internet in Africa or people in Africa don't have a clue, you know? So I, I started to understand that because when you're looking for um, maybe information or solutions to a problem you have and you Google it, you find solutions that are not really relevant to your context. Yeah. These things are coming from America, from the West. And I'm like, where are the African people, the bright people I know? I've worked with many of them. Why are they not putting out their ideas out there? So what I did was, rather than wait for somebody, I started writing my own stuff. I started putting it on, on LinkedIn. Incidentally, at the time, that was when LinkedIn launched their blogging platform, LinkedIn Pulse. So you got on LinkedIn Pulse, the Americans were there, at least on the English side, the Americans were there, the Australians were there, the British were there, but very skimpy African content. Mm. So I started putting out my stuff. 
And the moment, because at that point, the editorial team was trying to scale this and they wanted to have a global representation. So the moment they saw, okay, there's this African guy who is writing these interesting stuff. Let's, you know, encourage him. So they reached out to me from the LinkedIn uh, team. I think that was from Paris in France. And then they said they are going to start featuring some of my, you know, some of my articles so that it can get more exposure and more reach. And then I leaned on that and just <laughs> continued. And it was refreshing because before then, people typically saw LinkedIn as a place where you, you host your, the online version of your, of, your, of your CV, of your resume, right? Yeah. So people were much more in it. And then I started to put off all of that. Interestingly, there were, there were some pushbacks. And one of the most interesting ones I found, which I want to share is, when I started sharing all these opportunities in Africa, business trends, what some entrepreneurs are doing, people who are raising capital, I had a couple of fellows, but one of them particularly caught my attention. He reached out to me, sent me a message and said, who the hell is paying you? All these things you're writing about Africa, you're pushing propaganda, you know, wow. why are you doing this to people, right? Wow. These people need help. They need foreign aid, they need stuff. So why are you making it look like Africa? I'm like, I was really shocked because I, I didn't know there were such people. Who I, I've heard before that there are people who think like that, but what I did, I just made it very simple. I, screen, I took a screenshot of that message. I blurred out his name and I made it into a post. I said, guys, this is exactly what yeah. we're dealing with. There are people who believe that we're still living in huts. We're up to nothing because we're not, we're not speaking up. Let us show the world what is available. And that turned out to be a major post. It, it was, I think it was the post that moved a lot of people who were on the fence to take a side. And I'm going to talk about this later. Mm -hmm. That's the importance of emotional connection. You yeah. cannot be bland. You cannot be on the fence. You cannot put yourself in a position where people are indifferent to you. You have to stoke emotions and it needs to be targeted emotions. So the emotions I'm targeting, even though I'm working within the entrepreneurship space, I'm stoking emotions of excitement about opportunities. I'm stoking emotions of hunger, you know, yeah. for people who are looking for solutions. I'm, I'm stoking the emotions of anger. This is how the world thinks of Africa. They think we're up to no good right? This is what our problems are causing. So there's a bit of anger there. And there's also a bit of fear for, from some of the things I do, from some of the things I do. For example, if you are somewhere and you believe you are not maximizing your potential and you're not going to be, you're not going to be young and active forever, this mm -hmm. is the time to do something about it. There are people who are concerned. There are people within that segment who are really afraid for the future. And they want to, they've been hearing about this thing called entrepreneurship. They have a couple of bright ideas but they are free to make the jump, right? Because they are thinking maybe it might be the end of them. It might bring them financial ruin and, and stuff like that. So, so it, to answer your question more directly, I think being the first mover advantage helped me. There was yeah. a timing advantage mm -hmm. that I showed up on LinkedIn at the time when the, the platform was looking for people to get on board. Right yeah. now, it's, it's, it's much more restrictive because I guess they've already achieved their critical mass. So... Um, when you approach platforms, it's, it's, there's always an advantage in being a first mover or challenging the status quo. The status quo being a lot of Africans were linked in, but they were all behaving the same way. Right. They were passively consuming information and they just saw it as a place to put their CVs and look for jobs. I saw it as a platform for engagement and for pushing my message and my agenda and they turned out to help. <laughs>